Analysis of statically determinate trusses. Common types of trusses. A truss is one of the major types of engineering structures which provides a practical and economical solution for many engineering constructions, especially in the design of bridges and buildings that demand large spans. A truss is a structure composed of slender members joined together at their end points. The joint connections are usually formed by bolting or welding the ends of the members to a common plate called gusset. And this is the gusset plate. Planar trusses lie in a single plane and is often used to support roof or bridges. Roof trusses. They are often used as part of an industrial building frame. Roof load is transmitted to the truss at the joints by means of a series of purlins to keep the frame rigid and thereby capable of resisting horizontal wind forces knee braces are sometimes used at the supporting column so these are the parts of the roof trusses we have the roof the purlins we have the top cord of the truss and we have the gusset plates and these are the web members and these are bottom cord and we have the knee braces and we have the span of the truss and the bay or from column to column different types of trusses we have the scissors howie pratt fan fink cumbered fink Warren, bowstring, and three hinge arc. So these are the types of trusses. Bridge trusses. The main structural elements of a typical bridge truss are shown in the figure. Here it is seen that a load on the deck is first transmitted to stringers, then to floor beams, and finally to the joints of the two supporting side trusses. These are the stringers then to the beam finally to the joints of the two supporting side trusses the top and bottom cords of these side trusses are connected by top and bottom lateral bracing which serves to resist the lateral forces caused by wind and the side sway caused by moving vehicles on the bridge additional stability is provided by the portal and sway bracing as in the case of many long span trusses a ruler is provided at one end of a bridge truss to allow for thermal expansion top lateral bracing the sway brace the top cord and we have the portal bracing and these are the stringers and we have the panel the bottom cord and the deck and we have the floor beam and the portal and post. In particular, the Pratt, Howie, and Warren trusses are normally used for spans up to 61 meters in length. The most common form is the Warren truss with verticals. So these are the trusses. It has a span, a maximum span of 61 meters in length. For larger spans, a truss with a polygonal upper cord such as Parker truss is used for some savings in material. The wiring truss with verticals can also be fabricated in this manner for spans up to 91 meters. And this is the Parker truss. And for the assumptions for design, the members are joined together by smooth pins. All loadings are applied at the joints. Due to the two assumptions, each truss member acts as an actual force member. And for the classification of coplanar trusses, we have simple, compound, or complex truss. And for simple truss, to prevent collapse, the framework of a truss must be rigid. The simplest framework that is rigid or stable is a triangle. And this is the simple truss that form a triangle. For the compound truss, it is formed by connecting two or more simple truss together. Often, this type of truss is used to support loads acting over 
a larger span as it is cheaper to construct a lighter compound truss than a heavier simple truss. And we have three types of compound trusses. We have type 1, the trusses may be connected by a common joint and bar. Type 2, the trusses may be joined by three bars. And type 3, the trusses may be joined where bars of a large simple truss, called the main truss, have been substituted by a simple truss called secondary trusses. And these are the diagram for a compound truss with a simple trusses combined and form a compound truss. Complex truss. A complex truss is one that cannot be classified as being either simple or compound. And this is the example of a complex truss. And to find the determinacy of the truss, first, the total number of unknowns includes the forces in B, number of bars of the truss, and the total number of external support reactions are. Since the truss members are all straight axial force members lying in the same plane, the force system acting at each point is coplanar and concurrent. Consequently, rotational or moment equilibrium is automatically satisfied at the joint or pin. And to find the determinacy of the truss, we have the summation of forces along x is equal to 0 and summation of forces along y is equal to 0. By comparing the total unknowns with the total number of available equilibrium equations, we have B, the number of bars, plus R, the number of total reactions, is equal to 2J, and it is statically determinate. If B plus R is greater than 2J, it is statically indeterminate. And for stability, if B plus R is less than 2J, it means that truss is unstable or it will collapse. A truss can be unstable if it is statically determinate or statically indeterminate. Stability will have to be determined either through inspection or by force analysis. And for the stability in terms of external stability, a structure is externally unstable if all of its reactions are concurrent or parallel. The trusses are externally unstable since the support reactions have lines of action that are either concurrent or parallel. In this diagram, we have the unstable concurrent reactions, unstable parallel reactions, which means there's no horizontal reactions, so that's why it is unstable. And for the internal stability, the internal stability can be checked by careful inspection of the arrangement of its members. If it can be determined that each joint is held fixed so that it cannot move in a rigid body, since with respect or with respect to the other joints, then the truss will be stable. A simple truss will always be internally stable. If a truss is constructed, if a truss is constructed so that it does not hold its joints in a fixed position, it will be unstable or have a critical form. Determination of the member forces. We have the first method, which is the method of joints. First, satisfying the equilibrium equations for the forces exerted on the pin at each joint of the truss. Applications of equations yields two algebraic equations that can be solved for the two unknowns. Always assume that the unknown member forces acting on the joint's free body diagram to be in tension. And numerical solution of the equilibrium equations will yield positive scalars for members in tension and negative for those in compression. And the correct sense of direction of an unknown member force can in many cases be determined by inspection. A positive answer indicates that the sense is correct, whereas a negative answer indicates that the sense shown on the free body diagram must be reversed. And for the method of sections, if the forces in only a few members of, truss of a truss are to be found, the method of sections generally provide the most direct means of obtaining these forces. The method is created 
by the German scientist August Ritter from 18 or 1826 to 1908 and this method consists of passing an imaginary section through the truss thus cutting it into parts provided the entire truss is in equilibrium each of the two parts must also be in equilibrium the three equations of the equilibrium may be applied to either one of these two parts to determine the member forces at the cut section a decision must be made as to how to cut the truss in general the section should pass through not more than three members in which the forces are unknown when applying the equilibrium equations consider ways of writing the equations to yield a direct solution for each of the unknown rather than to solve simultaneous equations.